Week three is upon us. Welcome, everybody, to the Rutgers Football Podcast, presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, the official health care provider of Rutgers Athletics. Chris Carlin, joined by Eric Legrand as the Scarlet Knights now 1-1 one one on the season, and they will face Ohio State out in Columbus this coming weekend. We'll preview that matchup with the head coach, Greg Schiano in just a few minutes, and we will spend some time with Rutgers quarterback Noah Vedrill. But first of all, Big E, great to see you. Your big takeaways from this past Saturday against Indiana. Uh, I would say the first thing was this team fights, Chris. You can see the difference in that in these players. They fight to the very end. You know, no matter how much you're down by, you know, a Coach Shannon led team is going to fight. I remember in the NFL how they got a bunch of negative feedback for what he did with Eli Manning and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but I know how Coach Shiano is. And with these guys, on that last play of the game, when we got to see him scrambling around, throwing all these passes backwards, they were fighting until the very end. And if that play counts, they're right in the game. Go for onside kick. You never know what happens. You know, we'll talk to Coach more about that in a little bit, but as you're watching that play unfold, Uh, Is it a a play that you've been involved in in terms of practicing before uh, when you were playing? What was that like from, because I know you played on both sides of the ball, but also a lot of special teams too. Yeah, so I bet those plays, it's it's funny because in practice, you you get get to do it like maybe once or twice a week, if that, and you've seen the ball going thrown up and running around. The hardest part is actually for the defense because you see the ball, and no one stays in their lanes anymore. It's just, boom, you go flying to the ball this way, flying to the ball that. As you saw, Indiana was absolutely worn out, and everybody was on one side of the field when, uh, when Noah threw it back to Bo Melton, and there was absolutely nobody there. But the offensive side, you just want to stay behind the guy, stay behind the guy, give the guy an outlet that he can always throw it back to, whether if it's an offensive lineman, as we saw a few times, or if it's a skilled guy. You at least want to have one guy back there, but it's not over until that last play I was at still think it should have been a touchdown. All right, so Eric, take me inside the the mind of a player right now. You've got a couple of games under your belt to start the season. Where are you at mentally, physically, as you're dealing with everything that has come together? Yes, in a different way this season, but still, two games into the year, still very early. Yeah, I think you're actually starting to get used to now the flow of what it's like preparing for a game, not having to always go to, you know, just practice, 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 and school, school, school. Now you know what it's like for a game week. You're going into your third game of the season. There's no buys for you, so you now you're right in the grunt of it. You've got a little bit of understanding of what it's like now to prepare, what you need to do for your body to get that extra treatment, in, extra weight room sessions if you may need, or even if it comes to off-the-field stuff when it comes to study hall and things of that nature. You're learning how to balance your schedule, which is going to be crucial for these players, You know, going through these virtual classes and now also you're having to play a game week in and week out. Through, through eight straight weeks. So as a player, you're kind of getting used to that habit now and knowing how your body feels, what you need to do. And that's the best part about it because train behavior becomes instinct. Now you start to get used to doing those things and it's just because your natural instinct to do it. What's impressed you the most about this team through the first couple of weeks? You talked about the fight. What else has, stepped, has, has stuck out to you? The family. You can tell that these guys are, are just a, a big family. As Coach Shannon has now come in, he's got, got, he hasn't even been there for a year yet. But you could just see the brotherhood between the players, the coach and staff. As Shaheem Jones was on the sideline and Coach Tyquan Underwood had to go over there and console him because he was just so upset with himself from the forward pass that, you know, he it just he broke down. But you see Coach Coach uh, Underwood have him under his arms, talking to him, telling him to keep his head up, Bow Mountain going over there, tell him not to get too down on himself. He still made an incredible play. Things like that. It just goes to show you because sometimes you'll see sidelines on TV. You'll see a person isolated by himself or throwing helmets on the sideline. No, you don't see that. You see guys that are there to help each other through the good and through the bad. That's when you know you really have a true family bond. Eric, we saw that with Taekwon, uh, and I have to, I need to get used to saying Coach Underwood. We I saw that you see, with I Coach Taekwon Underwood. <laughs> well, we saw his arm around Shameen, and – Bo Melton this week really credited him with the the fact that he has been very productive here through the first couple of weeks of the year. Tyquan Underwood, from a personality standpoint, what is going to make him a good coach? 
Coach, Coach Underwood is the ultimate personality. You know, he's such a great guy, a good dude, and he he has confidence in himself. And I know it goes into his coaching technique. He has, you know, you know, you get wide receivers, you get to hear, oh yeah, they're so arrogant, this and that. No, Taekwon does it in a little swaggy way. It's funny. <laughs> it's like he's like he's not very you know blatant with it and very blunt. No, he does his attitude just with with the way he reacts, how he lifts up his guys. And how you can tell that the players love to play for him. One, because they know where he has been through the program and into the NFL. But two, the way that he goes about developing his relationships with those guys. You'll see them score a touchdown. I bet you see Coach Under was going to be one of the first ones in the end zone, chest bumping you and motivating you and getting you excited. And that's the energy that they need, and that's the confidence that they need, especially over the, from the past few years where they they had some, you know, a lot of down days and maybe not so much confidence. Now you're starting to see that in them. It's allowing them to go out there and play freely. And at the same time, you've been in the position of the recruit before. And you're watching the early success or the early energy that this team has had through a couple of games. Take me inside the mind of the recruit right now and being encouraged by what you see and seeing the early positive effects Coach Giano's return is having. Oh, you can, it's just night and day. That I think the difference between where the program was at where it is now and where it's going to go. You can just tell that by the way that the players are playing out there. They, I'm sure these coaches are developing relationships and can't imagine how many text messages or phone calls are made in, you know, in a week between the coaches and the players is whatever you can do because you want to develop that relationship with these people. You want to know that they care. If they're recruiting you, you know that they care for you. They believe that you could be a great football player, but an even better person. And the recruits have to open their eyes and realize that. And I think they're starting to see it because it's different when you have, you know, a little quick two to five minute call with a coach, a little pitch sale. But when you're on the call with 15, 20, 25 minutes with these recruits, it really goes to show you that it's not just about me as the football player. They want to know about more of my personality. And I know that's what these coaches are doing. Well, in just a few minutes, we'll visit with Rutgers head coach, Greg Schiano, And a little bit later on, Noah Vedrill, Rutgers' new quarterback, will join us as well as we'll talk about his growing up in a football family and we'll also preview the matchup with Ohio State in just a bit. Just getting started on week three of the Rutgers football podcast. It's presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, the official health care provider of Rutgers Athletics. We return to week three of the Rutgers football podcast with the head coach, Greg Schiano, as the Scarlet Knights prepare for Ohio State this weekend. And coach, just a brief recap of this past week against Indiana. And boy, I, I'll tell you, down the stretch of that game, the one thing that you had to be thrilled about was just the continued fight of your football team uh, and not letting any inch of it go at any point. Well, I was I was pleased with that, Chris. But I got to tell you, that's what I expect from them. Um, that's what we that's what we preach. That's what Chop is about. They've worked awfully hard. Um, I wish that we could have coached better, and I wish that we could have played better, because that was a winnable game. You know, we we the same way we won the game the week before is the way we lost it this week. We turned the ball over uh, in in a, in a very in some bad spots, and they had some short fields and. But they won. They, you know, I, I don't like when people say, oh, we, we lost, you know, we, we shot ourselves in the foot. No, we didn't. They, they took the gun and pointed at our foot, right? So they made that happen, and we, we, we weren't able to stop it. So that's where I am today is that one's behind us. We can't change it, but we're getting ready for a very good Ohio State team, and we, we need to really – lock in coach just one more about the game the other day the bizarre play at the end after you saw it and as it's unfolding i know you talked about how you practice that kind of a play but you never know how that's going to play out what uh kind of jumped out to you about the play itself well i think our guys really took coaching very well you know one of the rules on that play is you never go down with the ball like what's what's who cares if you lose by you know a loss is a loss. I really don't get into, well, uh, we lost by this many points or that many points. We're trying to win the game. And um, if you go down with the ball, you know one thing, you lost. So they did a great job. And, and um, you know, what Raekwon did is really taking coaching, right? He threw it up as high as he could to give our guys a chance to get under it. Um, there is no, other than the beginning of the play, there's not a set pattern per se. Uh, once it starts to go crazy, then it's just, 
hopefully what happens happens and, and literally it was inches right inches and some would say that it wasn't some would say that it was illegal so a, a legal pass i don't know nor do i waste time worrying about it you know a lot of times in my early years i used to you know make these intricate tapes and send them in i don't waste a minute on that it was called so it was an illegal forward pass regardless if it was or it wasn't it was called that's it you know you don't get do-overs so um we have instant replay they ruled it a forward pass move on as they responded in practice on monday what did you see from your team from an energy standpoint ready to get back to work oh they were great and i'll tell you they were sore that was a very physical game as you could tell by watching it and as a football player you get into routines right so Sunday is a day where we go out, we, we do certain things to help with the soreness, and then we go out and practice, which really is probably the best thing you can do for the soreness. And then Mondays is an off day, and players get caught up on everything they need to do in real life, as well as get their bodies feeling better. Well, we practiced on Monday, so I knew that they'd be feeling sore and stiff, but they came out with great energy, and we had a great practice. So that, that's not a given, right? That's when you, when you change up the routine, um, you never quite know how they're going to respond. And, and I thought they responded very well. Today is their off day, and then tomorrow we'll get back at it. Yeah, Coach, I was thinking about this the other day, and I think when one thing that I've heard from a lot of your former players, um, how they've been prepared for life off the field is the time management thing. And I'm wondering how that may have, uh, through the first couple of months of dealing not just with football but with school as well, helped ease them into their time management. Has that played a role at all in, in just giving them a chance to kind of get a little bit more used to it before you got into the meat of the season? It may have, Chris, but in this year, I don't know what's what. You know, I'm <laughs> just being real. It's just, I woke up this morning and I just laid there for a minute and thought about, like, seasons off, seasons on, like all the stuff that these kids have just chopped through, you know, I'm, I don't know even, you know, if we done as good a job of teaching this group time management as we did all our other teams, probably not because we're so busy fighting coronavirus and so busy, you know, guys are here at 540 in the morning to get tested so we can have our regular football meetings and do everything that we do. Like, it's just so unusual. And I, I really do. I tip my hat to our players because they're putting forth such a great effort just to be able to play, just to get to practice. Um, and that's the world we're in right now. And uh, I, I do. I, I think it's it's honorable the way they're working. I, I really um, have been fascinated by the comment you've made a couple of times now in reference to when coaches come into new situations and they have players who they didn't recruit, but they oftentimes you get an idea kind of behind the scenes of wait till we get our guys here. But you have been staunch in talking about how every player that has been here since you got here and stayed here and chose this are your guys. Can you expand just on that mentality a little bit? And I guess how you have to, as a coach, um, really build up some equity with them early and, and they understand that. Yeah, I think that's in any relationship, right? That's the key, that you build equity how do you build equity? You're 100% honest with them, and you do what you say you're going to do. So the more times you do that, pretty soon they start to trust you. Um, but I don't think it's just me. It's every coach, every support staff member. You know, I constantly, from the day we took the job, wanted our guys to understand, like, that's our number one job right now, is to build relationships with our players, because then they'll do everything we ask. Then they'll listen, then they'll do the, the film study and they'll go to class and they'll do the study hall. But if they don't trust you, it's awfully hard for them to follow your way. So that's been the most critical thing. And, and uh, I have said it a number of times because we've had several, I mean, it's documented how many people have decided this isn't for them. And I understand that. I don't think that makes them bad people. Our program is unique um, academically. The there's zero, you know, there's certain things that I am very, very loose with. I don't care. You know, you do whatever you want to do. But then there's other things that there's zero tolerance for anything but what we say. And 
I make it very clear to the guys, and I do that. I did that from the very first meeting because I didn't want anybody to be tricked into staying. I don't care if they're a great player. It doesn't matter. We're building something here for the long game. But it doesn't mean that as you build something, you can't have a series of one-game seasons where you're just trying to win the season, that one season. And, you know, I mentioned it this week because I mentioned it to our team. Literally, when you lose a game, there's like a morning that goes on. You know, you put so much of yourself into this week of preparation and then it doesn't pay off in a win. That hurts. It hurts players, it hurts coaches, but you got to get over it because the next one's coming. And so you have Sunday to kind of work through it. And, you know, we used to call it the 24-hour rule. I, I really don't talk about that anymore. I just tell them, you know, there's a freight train coming down the track and you better get your speed ready because we're going to collide. And if you're, if you're not gathering speed, right, you know, I give them Sunday. But by the time we hit the practice field on Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon, we need to be, we need to be moving forward. And that's why we do it, to get that one behind. And that's why I really didn't like this week because we couldn't go out and practice Sunday because we were going to go out Monday. So, again, I thought Monday they did it Monday morning. As a matter of fact, we're a morning practice team. So this really hurts morning practice teams more than anybody. Because, you know, if you're an afternoon practice team, you had till Monday – three, four o'clock to get your game plan finished. You know, our game plan had to be done Sunday night before we left here, which, but honestly, a lot of people didn't leave here to get it ready in time. Um, and I don't like that. I think guys need to go home. I think they need to sleep in their bed. But, you know, drastic, drastic times, you got to do that stuff. We'll have more with Coach. Get your questions for him in just a moment when we return. This is the Rutgers Football Podcast presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, official health care provider, of Rutgers Athletics. Time for your questions for Coach Shiano. We can take them every week via Twitter with the hashtag RFootballPodcast. First one this week, Coach, comes from uh, Steve, who wants to know, after two weeks into the season, biggest key areas of emphasis you're getting across to the team as you move into week three? You know, I, there's so many things. I think the biggest thing is going to be just the continual growth of our culture because that will take care of so many other things uh you know in our culture as you know family trust chop we just have to continue to live by that um and that's that's every situation i think you can bring it back to that and when we when we do a good job of that i think it connects the dots connect for the players and when coaches get too caught up in a step here and an angle here and an elbow level here and forget culture that's when you get yourself uh, behind the eight ball. So we need to continue to coach all the details, but we need to make sure that at the front of everything is the cultural development of our program. Mark wants to know how you would assess Noah Vedral so far through the first two games. Well, you know, obviously we named him our starter coming out of what is, I guess we call a camp, although it wasn't a camp. Um, we think very highly of Noah. He has a really high football IQ. He learns well. I think he runs the offense uh, well. Unfortunately, he, he got hit a few times as he was throwing Saturday, and it caused for bad outcomes. Uh, hopefully, we can do a little job, better job protecting, and hopefully he can have that clock in his head going off, that alarm going off. i got to get rid of this thing here. And as we get better, that alarm will be a little later each time. But uh, right now, we got to make sure we get rid of the football. John wants to know about Karon Adams, who gave you a spark the other day in the run game. Would you rather be a coach who rides one running back, or do you like the idea of the committee more? Riding a running back, mind you, when that back is particularly hot. Well, we're going to ride the back when he's hot. I guarantee you that. I mean, I, I believe in that. But we do certain things schematically that we want different players on the field, and that kind of builds a rest in for guys. Um I like in the Big Ten Conference having many backs because I think this is a physical big boy league and there's some real hitting that goes on. And when you're a running back, you know, sometimes you don't even know where the shots are coming from, right? I mean, you're running one way and there's people taking blind shots at you. So I think we're blessed to have some good running backs on our team and they, they all practice very hard. So I think we try to get, if, they're, uh, if they've earned it, they, we try to get them a role in the game plan. Uh, Steve also wants to know, Coach, a uh, different Steve, what's pleased you the most from back in June or July when you got them all together to right now in this team's development? 
Well, I think the bonds that are being formed please me the most. You know, the the trust, the relationships um, that only going through the fire can create, right? You can, we as coaches try to create um, adversity. We try to create, you know, some tough situations to help that development, you know, expedite that. But the reality is uh, there's nothing harder than winning a Big Ten football game in athletics. And uh, I think it's like I said many times, I think it's like winning a game in the National Football League. It's hard. And it takes intense focus for three, four hours. And all the preparation that goes into it. And when you do that together, I think certain bonds are formed that, you know, otherwise you can't really get no matter how much you try to create it. All right, Coach, Ohio State this week, and nobody's more familiar with that program than you. Justin Fields, obviously a dynamic player. Give us a scouting report. What do you expect, what you expect from the Buckeyes? Well, you hit it on the head, Chris. They're a dynamic football team. They're, you know, probably the best one, two, or three teams in America. Um, they have really good players at just about every position. Uh, it's really not where you say, oh, they have a weakness here or there. You know, if you watch the game the other night, maybe their place kicking was a little erratic because they've had injuries and what have you. Um, but, you know, that's you go pretty far down the list to get to get to that. <laughs> right? I mean, their O-line's outstanding. Their D-line's outstanding. That's where the game starts. Uh, their quarterback, obviously, tremendous player, maybe the best in America. So, I mean, they have really good players, and they're well-coached. Coach Day and his staff do a tremendous job. Uh, they have tradition, all the things that go along with being a, 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 one of the top programs in America. That's what we aspire to, right? That's what, um, you know, in our own way, we're never going to out Ohio State, Ohio State. We're going to out Rutgers people. That's what we're going to do. And that's what our goal is. And we're going to take bits and pieces from everybody. And But where we'd like our result to end up is what we've said. We want to be uh, the best team in America. And, and or, you know, to be the best, you got to be one of the top five. And then hopefully you get to become that. So we have a long way to go, but this will be a great opportunity for us to go out and swing as hard as we can. See what happens. Prime time Saturday night. Looking forward to it in Columbus. Coach, we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good, Chris. Thank you. Eric rejoins us along with Noah Vedral in moments right here on the Rutgers Football Podcast presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, the official health care provider of Rutgers Athletics. Time to chop it up with the newest Rutgers quarterback, and that is Noah Vedral, who joins us right now. Noah, it's Chris and Eric. We appreciate your time. How you doing? I'm good, guys. How are you? Doing We're doing well. outstanding. And, you know, Noah, let's first of all, just give us your uh, thoughts the first couple of the games of the season for you, how comfortable you are feeling inside the Rutgers program right now. No, um, I think I've said it a couple of times before. This place has a really kind of been like a newfound home for me. Um, uh, I was talking to you guys a little bit before we got started. This place, um, all I know is this family. Um, so I'm getting to know the guys really well. I mean, we're really the only people we get to see with the COVID thing and trying to keep our personal bubbles intact and stay safe and stay healthy. So um, I'm feeling really comfortable with the guys, um, the offense. I mean, every day I'm in it, you get more and more comfortable. Every game you get on, in that offense, you feel a lot better about things. So um a lot of things to improve on um but a lot of positives too and what are the i always say what are the biggest differences i guess you see going from you know ucf to nebraska to Rutgers. so you've been all, you know, all different places on the map and you different universities now as a veteran you know what is it like going through this whole college football process and getting to see different universities and how they operate it's super um super cool um i want to be a coach when i'm done so um to kind of have that experience at a couple different places a little bit of background some perspective is really cool um, for me, maybe down the future when I want to pull things from different places. Um, but I'm super excited about Rutgers. I'm super excited about the plan Coach Chiano has in place. And um, we've got a lot of good stuff in store for us. We just got to keep chopping. Rutgers quarterback Noah Vedral with us. So you want to coach down the line. Fans here haven't really gotten to know him personally, but give us a sense about what it's like to play for Sean Gleason. What do you love about him? He's a high energy guy. Um, he's a offensive genius um every week it's fun to come into the meeting rooms on mondays and see what he's got for us um so it's super fun he's at practice i mean it's um coach Shiano always says that leaders don't get days off and i think coach gleason does a really good job embodying that we we rarely see him miss a beat um he's always on point he's always high energy um and with our up-tempo spread stuff i think that's that's very critical so he keeps us going and um 
sometimes on those practices where it's a little down, he's that um, lifeline right to the middle of it all, keeping it going, keeping us afloat. And um, I think the guys respond really well to him. And take us to what it's like developing a relationship and a trust with your wide receivers and running backs in the off season, especially due with this due to COVID nineteen, not having a lot of time together. But what it was like being able to develop those relationships with those guys, knowing where they're going to be, what type of throws they like, and at the same time as competing for a position with Art Sikowski. So can you explain what it was like competing for those reps and also developing those relationships? Yeah, no. On on any team that wants to be competitive, um, there's always internal competition. Um, and I think um, what Coach Shiano and Coach Gleason did um, with our team this year is they kept that competition healthy. Um, on the practice field, things are um, they're tough. They're competitive. They're gritty. Um, but they do a good job when we're in our WebEx meetings in the summer, when we're in our meetings, that hey, we're still one unit. Um, you're your position group. One guy succeeds, all guys succeed. One guy fails, all guys fail. Um, so I think that's how across positions um, we've been able to keep that kind of the unity, that unity of focus, unity of direction, stuff like that. But um, with the receivers in the offseason, um, we did a lot of extra stuff um, with it being a new offense for everybody. Um, there was a lot of uh, motivation to get out there um, as many days as we could every weekend, multiple days during the week um, and get through the installs. Um, with COVID chopping things up and making things super weird and on and off again, there was a lot of chances for us to go through the install multiple times because um, you weren't really able to progress into your really advanced stuff. So I think um, that trust of the receivers came through those multiple trips to the installs, um, which was actually, um, you could say, a blessing in disguise, but just kind of finding a silver lining in the mess. No, I, I, I know we've talked about football families before, but I've never seen one like yours. I mean, you have a father and three uncles, all who played at Nebraska, and you played for your grandfather in high school. Tell me about what it was like growing up in that atmosphere. Um, well, Thanksgiving was a coach's clinic. Um, it was always <laughs> Thanksgiving in Nebraska is around the time when the state championships are being played and kind of late playoffs. So whoever was still alive or usually the season would wrap up right before that. So Thanksgiving was always a time for people to come back and tell some stories, uh, talk about some crazy things that happened during the high school season. So um, I always think that's one of my things that I don't think people get to experience coming from a football family is that Thanksgiving is like a coach's clinic. I've been sitting in on offensive ideas. I mean, I had three uncles that played in Nebraska along with my dad. And then um, both of my uncles on my mom's side are offensive coaches. One's a head coach, one's an offensive coordinator. Um, so Thanksgiving is, is really is like a coach's clinic. There's, there's a lot of ideas flying around, a lot of stories. So um, even Christmas, it would carry over all the way to Christmas. We'd still be talking about stuff like that. So um, it's just something you never escaped. Finally, Noah, when you were making your decision, what made Rutgers the right place for you? Um, really, Coach Ciano, um was what sold me the most. Um, his culture, his vision, um, the opportunity that this place had in store for um, a team that wanted to work, a team that was willing to put in the hours. And um, I was really super excited for a, an opportunity like this, having multiple years left. Um, I think it would have been tough with one year. I wanted to see um, just how far Coach Ciano can take it. I think I'm going to get a good taste of that. Um, getting a couple years at it. Well, we're looking forward to it. It's been great to see you play so far, and we appreciate the time, Noah. Thanks so much. Good luck on Saturday in Columbus. Thank you, guys. Thanks again. Noah Vedral, Rutgers quarterback, joining us on the Rutgers Football Podcast. When we come back, we'll preview the matchup with the Buckeyes in just moments. Stay with us. This is the Rutgers Football Podcast presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, the official health care provider of Rutgers Athletics. And so the Scarlet Knights get ready for Ohio State this coming Saturday evening out in Columbus. Chris Carlin, Eric Legrand, back on week three of the Rutgers Football Podcast, presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, the official health care provider of Rutgers Athletics. E, it is always going to be a daunting task in the Big Ten week in and week out, but when you're facing the likes of a top three team in the country like Ohio State, it gets even a little bit uh more daunting, so to speak. What impresses you so far about Rutgers in trying to get, let me, let me do this again, Colin, because I was all over the map there. Whenever I tape, I always got to screw it up. <laughs> yeah. Five. All right. Three, two, one. And so Rutgers facing Ohio State this coming Saturday. This is week three of the Rutgers Football Podcast, presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, official health care provider 
of Rutgers Athletics. Chris Carlin, Eric Legrand, back with you. Eric, when you're getting ready for one of the top teams in the country, what is that mentality like for a football player? Well, as a football player, it's an opportunity. An opportunity to measure where you're at against the amongst the elites. Opportunity to have all odds against you and try to fight your way. No one is going to pick you. No one is going to believe in you. But you have the opportunity to go up and upset the world, shock the world. That sometimes being an underdog is a cool situation, believe me. It's not always, you know, the, you know, uh, supply me, you know, the workers are just going to go out there, we're going to get steamrolled. No, you have to say, we're going out there to try to win this game. Obviously, when it comes to Ohio State, they are a different beast. So you have to say pretty much playing a mistake free game, which is almost impossible to do. But in order to beat a team like Ohio State, you have to be pretty much perfect out there. When you have an athlete like Justin Fields, Eric, and you're a defensive player, uh, the way he can throw the football, the way he can run around, uh, what's the best way to try to prepare for a guy like that or to approach a guy like that? Oh, uh, you have to, when it's it depending on the position, you know, you don't, he can move around. So if I'm the defensive line, I know I have to be contained on the outside and strict with my pass rush lanes, making sure I'm not trying to make a play here because as soon as I jump out of my gap and make try to make a play, that's when he is going to expose me. The linebacker situation you got to make sure you're doing the right reads, whether if it's all those zone that they love to do, the, you know, the fake zone, whether if it's going to be a play action or fake. got to make sure you're covering your guys down the field. And then the defensive backs, now that's the daunting task, but you got to cover these elite wide receivers that they have also by trying to keep your eyes on him when he starts scrambling around and making sure you're coming up and filling, you're filling in the run game or making sure he's not picking up too many yards. But you also, you got to be able to try to blanket covers these guys because as soon as they get one step past you, that's it. So, yeah, and, and you see Justin Fields is not shy of trying to push that ball down the field. Eric, the, the offense, where have you seen the most growth? What do you like the most about what Sean Gleason has done? I think the, being able to spread out the ball a little bit more, get more guys involved. You know, you get you get Christian involved in the game. Pacheco's involved. Aaron Young is getting the ball. Shaheem Jones. Bo Melton. I would like to see a little bit more from the tight end position, but you're starting to see if these skill guys are starting to be able to touch the ball and actually get some, you know, positive yards and not always going backwards, backwards, backwards and stuff. So I think that's pretty cool. And it's finding unique ways to get them involved as well, which I, I, I kind of like. And I'm, I'm excited to see the game plan that he comes up with for Ohio State. Because you're going to have to find unique ways to get yards here. So I'm really going to, it's going to test his coaching level now on what he can do to try to create positive yards. But I think all around, he's been able to spread out the ball a little bit and, you do have a quarterback in Noah that can run around a little bit. And we saw a running back last week, and we talked to Coach Shiano about this, and K. Ron Adams, a guy who's from Ohio, who uh, was able to really provide a, a nice spark for Rutgers in the run game. 38-yard touchdown run, but really some explosiveness when the other two guys were getting a bit of a breather. How about that? So K. Ron Adams, he, I, I, mean, I like him a lot because even when we got to see him in the garbage time over the past you know, few years, He's always productive. Even I know it might be the rest of the second team defenses when he was getting his chances, but the guy was always productive. He came in there and, and let a spark, and he had long drives and breakaway touchdowns, and now he got the opportunity versus Indiana to go up there with the ones, and he just shows what he can do. I believe he earned the right to touch the ball a little bit more now, Chris, and we should see him a lot more going, you know, going forward throughout the season. Uh, we also talked to Coach about this, Eric. Last one for me on this. The idea of playing at night – it's different. Everybody loves to play under the lights and, and obviously be in the spotlight, uh, a game on BTN uh, at 730. But there's also having to wait all day and get ready for a game like that. How difficult is that to kind of navigate when it's not just get out there and play? It's all right, sit tight, kind of manage your energy for the day. Yeah, that's where you're going now when you have to learn when we played at night. We had to learn how to be able to, you know, not waking up early, breakfast, pregame, you know, pregame meetings and go. It was like, okay, you have your pregame meeting, your pregame meal, have your breakfast and all that stuff. Then you usually have that time where you can just relax a little bit. And it's like, do I want to take a nap? Do I want to watch some games? Do I want to study some film? Every player is going to be a little bit different. Some player can be up all day and all night and they're fine to go. Some people can take it down and take that little two-hour nap that they get 
Or some people like to watch a movie and take their take their minds away. Me and myself, I used to like I used to watch movies on my laptop a little bit. Go, uh, you know, go through a little bit of stuff that wasn't fully sure on still from the playbook and just wanna just to cure everything up. But I did like to take myself just away for a little bit just so I can pass by some time instead of sitting there focused. Cause as you as you know, coach says, you know how hard it is to focus for a three, four hour game. And if you're thinking about it all day long, by the time the game comes at seven thirty, you're exhausted. So I always try to take myself away for a little bit of the, from laying down or just watching a movie. Well, we're looking forward to it Saturday night. Looking forward to talking to you Saturday night, my friend, as Rutgers travels out to Columbus to face the Buckeyes. We'll talk to you then. Sounds good, Chris. Make sure you're there on BTN and, of course, on the RWJ Barnabas Health Rutgers Sports Network, the Scarlet Knights, and the Buckeyes from Ohio Stadium out in Columbus. We'll see you next week on the Rutgers Football Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us right here. It is the Rutgers Football Podcast presented by RWJ Barnabas Health, the official health care provider of Rutgers Athletics.